next year. Call 800 678 7027. 800 678 7027. Oh my 365. God. Just forget about all that. <laughs> <laughs> Just forget about all that nonsense. We are going to do this. Um, Ariana is in this. So let's do this. Let's get a hold of our actual guest who was going to join us. Um, Harlan Oomen is going to be with us. And uh, we tried to call him on the old skip Skype. He, of course, is... Nowhere to be found, so we are going to call him on the telephone. And we will get Harlan in here. Harlan, can you Hi. hear us, my friend? <laughs> How are you? How was your Pretty interview? good, actually. I was, I apologize. I was doing um, an interview with a gentleman on Zoom, and I cannot stand Zoom. And so it takes about 20 minutes to get Zoom set up through our system. And then I can actually do the interview. So we are now to you. <laughs> Welcome to the broadcast. How are you, my friend? Thank you. Thanks for having me back. So, Harlan, you have got some incredible news. Uh, to tell us a little bit about the latest with you, my friend. Well, we're pushing our book sales. Um as time goes on, the book, as you know, The Fifth Horseman and The New Man, how massive attacks of disruption became a looming existential danger to a divided nation, is becoming more and more predictive of what's happening. And the solutions are not forthcoming. And so the book is optimistic in the last three chapters, James, in which it proposes what needs to be done. And the needs are just getting greater and greater and greater. I make the observation that the three most unpopular people and things in America today are Joe Biden, Donald Trump, and the U.S. Congress, which gives you some <laughs> idea of the State of the Union. <laughs> so, uh, what, what, is, what has been some feedback that you've gotten on your book so far, my friend? Well, the feedback, the feedback has been universally terrific. I've gotten great reviews, uh, and I get constant re-invitations to speak. But for some reason... Uh, maybe the title's too long or people are not interested in foreign policy or not interested in books that are not telling tales on other people. Um, the book is not selling as widely as I had hoped or my publisher had hoped. Even though when you read it, it it's written in, in, in very, very simple, plain English. And much of it reads like a novel in terms of describing how we got to the situation and then describing a number of scenarios that could unfold that describe the danger of the seven major disruptors from failed and failing government to climate change to social media, cyber, and the rest. In fact, the scenarios are really interesting, and they're playing out what you are seeing on the January 6th hearings on the Hill over the insurrection that took place was predicted in my book and how a president, and I wasn't referring to Donald Trump, but how a president could use the 12th Amendment and the Electoral College Act of 1887 to overthrow the Electoral College. And so... That's playing out, and of course how you fix it is to fix the 12th Amendment, which we're not going to do with the Electoral College Act, because someone in the future could very, very easily bypass the Electoral College if they were smart. And the reason, this may sound very technical, but the Constitution states that if the Electoral College cannot reach a majority, the election then goes to the House of Representatives. But the House does not vote on total numbers of representatives, it votes on states. So that, for example, if today or 2024 and the representation in the, in the House remains the same with 26 states represented by Republicans and 24 by Democrats, a Democrat could win the election by God knows how many, 50 million votes and still lose in the House of Representatives. So these are different contradictions that have got to be fixed in order for us to have a really functioning, properly functioning government and political system. So uh, how do we get there? That's the really that you know that's the question I raise in my book. Right now, to be very very frank, the only way we get there immediately, since it's the Congress is not going to pick up my recommendations, and even if they did, it would take time to implement. We only have one president at a time, and Joe Biden, despite all his failings, and there are many, has to exercise leadership and competence. What I believe he's got to do, and I argue for this in the book. And I say a president, not the current president, but a president has to bring members of Congress, meaning the speaker, 
the majority leaders of both houses and the minority leaders into a meeting in Camp David or wherever, lock the door, throw the key away until we can come to some agreement on basic issues over energy, over the budget, over inflation, over gasoline prices, over the border. And unless we can do that, the country is going to be continually riven by these huge differences, and people have genuine criticisms with inflation, gas prices, and everything else, increase in violence, mass shootings. Wherever you look, this nation is not in a happy state. And not only that, but overseas, people like Vladimir Putin and China's President Xi Jinping are looking at America and saying, this is a great opportunity for us. America and the West are falling apart. Britain does not have a prime minister except Boris Johnson's an interim one. President Macron of France has lost a majority in the assembly, and so he's weakened. Italy is only a caretaker government, so the West is falling apart. Biden goes to, to, see Prince, uh, goes to Saudi Arabia. He becomes a laughingstock, and the Americans can't seem to do anything right. And these are the arguments, and to some degree, they've got some credibility behind them that our, our adversaries overseas are making, and they're having an impact because people uh, no longer see the United States as the shining city on a hill or the formidable power and influence it once was. And that's got to turn around, not only because it's important for America, but it's important for global stability. We've got a great guest with us today. Harlan Ullman joins us here on our big broadcast. And uh, so what has been some feedback you've gotten on this book so far? Well, as you asked, excellent. I mean, everybody who reads it loves it. Every radio interview or television interview, people say, come back and let's talk about it because it's filled with <laughs> extraordinary, extraordinary things. For example, James, um, there's a chapter that compares the 1918 to 1920 Spanish flu with today. And it's remarkable because if we think we are in distress today, and I'll go into the big difference, 1918 and 1920 in many ways was far worse. First, the country was at war. World War One, and it wasn't certain that World War One was going to be won. Second, we had no president. Woodrow Wilson had a stroke, and Edith Wilson, his wife, was running the country. Third, nobody knew how to deal with the pandemic of the Spanish flu. But Woodrow Wilson rejected that there was a Spanish flu. On top of that, the Espionage and Sedition Acts that were in place made it against the law to criticize the government, and even to the point of criticizing army uniforms. And the whole issue of terrorism was run amok. There were 24 letter bombs that killed three people that resulted in the so-called Palmer raids. Um, Palmer was then the attorney general, and tens of thousands of people were arrested without due process. The nation was panicked by all this. And so the situation in America, 1918 to 1920, was very grim. The advantage was there was no social network. Cities and people were really disjointed. And so there was not necessarily a national understanding of what was happening elsewhere. But certainly throughout parts of the country, we were in huge crisis. And then what happened, and this is really germane to today and, and germane to my argument for a national infrastructure investment bank, the company, the country experienced the greatest economic renewal in its history. Why? First, Warren Harding became president, Republican, and even though he died after just over two years, put in place the mechanisms with the first Highway Act, but at that time, Henry Ford and, and Walter Chrysler will sell you a car in any color, provided it was black, but automobiles were booming because of pent-up demand. With automobiles, you had the need for rubber, you had the need for steel, you had the need for leather, you had the need for concrete for roads and hospitality, and more importantly, electricity was now being established throughout the country, and electrification of the country was probably the greatest productivity we've had in our history. Now today, we don't necessarily have the car industry or electrification, but we have artificial intelligence. We have the information revolution. We have these huge, huge advantages in technology in terms of virtually everything you can think of, from genomics and biology to producing artificial fuels, et cetera, et cetera. And knowledge is doubling virtually every year. So we need to exploit that. And I think we could, if we had common sense and we had some sense of government that was working, we could do that. But we're not doing it yet. We've passed the $1.2 trillion infrastructure plan. That's not enough. It's not got the right oversight. And local regulation is going to make sure that we don't get the bank for our buck. 
And so I argue in the book for three three to $4 trillion uh, infrastructure account that's paid for by bonds, as we did in World War II with war bonds, but in part would be repaid back by the government taking interest, and that is to say equity in companies in which it invests in these technology areas, which we did in essence in 2008 after the financial collapse when $800 billion, billion dollars were appropriated to go to the banks, making them public. And when the banks repaid the loans, which they did very quickly, the government had equity in terms of warrants and made tens of billions of dollars. Why can't we do that again? The technology is there. The people are there. All we've got to do is marry up government and this resource. And unfortunately, all the lines have been interrupted, cut, (laughs) or disestablished for the time being, which is really very, very sorry, but we could do that. And so the possibilities are still great. But unfortunately, the fact that government is not working and is failing is the biggest disruptor we have and the biggest danger to the future of America, in my judgment. We have got Harlan Ullman with us today. He joins us live here on our big broadcast. So, uh, Harlan, as we wrap up here with you, my friend, how do we get your book and get involved with what you're doing online? Well, first of all, I've got columns that come out on Monday in The Hill and Wednesday on UPI. Read them. The quickest way, if you don't have a local bookstore, is to go on Amazon, click, and the book will be there in 